this is Gary Carpenter again. And uh, I hope you've had a chance to listen to the first video that, that I did. I kind of real quickly summarized uh, my journey with my wife. Really, it started as a young man searching for God. God has always been so good to me. I'm the one that's walked away from Him. He's never walked away from me. And even though I walked away from Him several times in my life, He never, he never quit coming after me. So I told on the previous tape how he even sent a man in, uh, like a guerrilla fighter over into the business world to get me because I wasn't, I wasn't going to attend church anymore, and he knew it. But God loved me more than too much to just leave me. He came after me again, and he got me too. So I told in the, on the last video how uh, my wife and I got saved and uh, baptized in the Holy Ghost in 1980. And really, that was the end of our backsliding. We never went back to the bars after that. The things of the world never really appealed to us after that so much. Uh, our lives, we were trying to give it to God. During that first 12 years, we got involved in the prison ministry of the young man that had led us to the Lord. And uh, we saw people get saved and get healed there. We, we did Bible studies in other people's homes and and we saw people get saved and, and healed and filled with the Holy Ghost there. Uh, we, we, uh, we did a lot of things for the Lord. We, uh, I, I was even worship leader for a short time just because I, I was I, in the church. I was the only one that knew how to play a guitar. And so uh, what, what, basically whatever our hand could find to do, we did it. Uh, in, in that prison ministry, nobody financed it. Uh, we we made we'd made our own money. Uh, uh, we'd we'd buy our own gas. We'd buy our own materials to hand out. We didn't expect anybody else to do it. We we were happy to make money and use it for Jesus. Uh, anything that we could to to uh, we see the thing about Sue and I. And it still gets me to this day. Is uh, we were so lost. We were 33 years old when we really really came to the Lord. And it, I feel uh, sp especially, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to put it, I, I had walked away from him. And I did it because I loved the world more than I loved him. And I'd done it more than once. And still, still he loved me too much. And he kept sending laborers after me till he got me. Well, boy, once you've really been saved like that, and you know for sure that you deserved hell. And you find out God loves you, comes after you again, saves you. Boy, we, Sue and I, we've never looked back. We never, n never wanted to go back to the world after that. We just wanted to serve Jesus, but how? Well, in the first 12 years, we learned a lot of things. We, we, we uh, uh, learned mostly about the, the, the Word of God itself. We learned about faith. We learned what faith is. And we had some great victories during that period of time. And uh, we continued to serve the Lord. But the one thing, it seemed like what was happening is like, okay, an opportunity would present itself. Let's go do that for Jesus. And, and so we, we would just go do it. And it would seem to be okay for a while, but eventually it would like hit a brick wall and that would come to an end. And well, we'll go do this for the Lord. And it was just kind of what was there, uh, uh, what we would find to do. And we would just, just do it. Now, we did have victories. I, I told on the previous tape how the Lord delivered me from a, a bout with uh, what the doctors called terminal cancer at first. I uh, was delivered from that. Uh, we had other things uh, that I could, could tell about. I probably will on other tapes, but I want to get to something specific on this one. See, what seemed to be lacking during that first 12 years is what I would call the real leadership of the Holy Spirit. I used to be so jealous of the 12. I'd read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as they would follow Jesus. and I would picture in my mind what it must have been like, you know, as they would go from village to village. and You know, from time to time, they'd, they'd wind up making a campfire at night. And they'd spend the night. And I, could just, I could just see Jesus teaching his disciples. And they were free to ask him questions if they didn't understand. And he would, he would explain to them. And, then if they didn't know what to do the next day, they didn't have to guess. They didn't have to just say, well, let's see what all's available and 
I'll pick something. No, he would assign them what to do. I'd read that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I, I would get so jealous. I'd go, Lord, I wish there was some way that I could hear you today. Because I, I know you're alive. I know you're seated at the right hand of the Father, but I can't seem to hear your voice. And I know you probably have a plan, but I don't know how in the world. I've, I've prayed. I've listened. I've done everything that I know how to do. In English, I've prayed. But Lord, I, I just don't, I'm just going to do the best I can. Well, you know, and that's, that's a walk that I think many, many people have with the Lord. And it's not like the Lord won't bless that. He will. He says, you can't even give a cup of cold water in my name and, and lose your reward. But then as I would read the book of Acts, see, and that's after the resurrection. That's, that's the same dispensation that we're in now. And I would especially read about Paul. Paul wasn't hand trained by Jesus himself in the flesh. Jesus had already ascended to be with the Father. When Paul, when, well, who originally was Saul of Tarsus, when he got born again on the Damascus Road, he didn't get to follow Jesus in the flesh for three years like Peter and John and the rest of them did. Somehow he got trained without Jesus physically being there to teach him. Plus, I saw especially in Acts 16, you can read it for yourself, where Paul and Silas, they had finished their assignment and they didn't know what to do next. So they were weighing in their minds what to do, pretty much the same way that Sue and I had been doing it. And they were thinking, well, maybe we should go to Asia. Maybe Asia is where we should go next. And it says the Holy Spirit, he didn't allow that. So then they thought, hmm, well, maybe we should go to Bithynia. They need the gospel over there. And see, the way I was raised, it's just strictly all by the word. Uh, don't we have chapter and verse, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel into every creature? Yeah, we have chapter and verse for that. Well, isn't Asia in the world? Yeah. Isn't Bithynia in the world? The way I grew up, it would be like, well, there you go. Just pick one <laughs> and go do it. And, and he will bless that. He will bless that, that, that type of uh, ministry. And for the first 12 years of our life, that's pretty well how we lived. We would just see what was available to do and we'd go do that. Well, in Acts there, it says the Holy Spirit says, no, I don't want you. Now later on, see, Paul did go to Asia. He spent a long time in Asia. In fact, it says the whole, that was Ephesus and it says all of Asia heard the word of God through Paul. But it, there's a timing of the Lord. Jesus is alive and well. And I knew that and I always hungered, how do I hear him today? How do I find out what his plan is for my life. And we, we never could find it till we started attending the, the prayer center. Well, I saw in the book of Acts there, I saw that the Holy Spirit was the one that was giving them direction. It says the, the Spirit said, no, don't go to Asia, don't go to Bithynia. And then in a night vision, I don't know whether Paul was asleep or whether it was just a vision that occurred in the night, but in a, in a vision in the night, Paul said, uh, we're, we're in the book of Acts, we see that, uh, that, that the Holy Spirit brought a dream to Paul or a vision. And it says, he saw a man from Macedonia. And in this dream, that man is going, come over into Macedonia and help us. Well, now he knew what to do. And his, so him and Silas, they, they set right out the next day. And you can read about it, all of the great things that happened there. I hungered for that kind of leadership. I said, there's there's got, if, if, if they had that kind of leadership in the book of Acts, we're in the same dispensation. That's after the resurrection. That's after the day of Pentecost. That's the same dispensation, if you'll allow me, that I live in. I knew that there had to be a way, but how in the world to find it? I did not know. I had prayed in English till my lips fell off on the floor. I had listened. I had got quiet. I had done everything that I'd ever heard anybody say. And now I, I would hear the Lord on moral issues like everybody does, you know. He, he'll speak to you like, uh, well, should I, you know, uh, sh should I get revenge? No. Should I, should I go see that movie? No. I mean, there's, I would hear the Lord in that way. But I'm talking about the real plan of God, the leadership for your life. I didn't even know what I was in the body of Christ. To be honest with you, I just kind of assumed someday I'd wind up being a pastor. Uh, I mean, the denomination I grew up in pretty well said everything had passed away. There wasn't any apostles or prophets anymore. 
pretty well everything had passed away except pastor and teacher anyway, an evangelist, I guess. So I just assumed that one day I'd wind up being a pastor. My temperament is kind of uh, such that I thought, well, I'll pastor a church someday. But I had no way of finding out, really, if that was God's calling on my life or not. Well, let's talk about 1992, June of 1992. And uh, Sue and I had gone through a uh, somewhat of a wilderness experience for about five years. Uh, we had lost our bearings a little bit. Now, we hadn't backslid and gone back to the world at all. But we weren't charging hell with a water pistol anymore either. <laughs> That's an expression Pastor Dave uses all the time. He says, you remember those early days when you'd charge hell with a water pistol? Yeah, I do. He says, you remember how your, you got your eyebrows singed off and you weren't so eager to do that anymore? Yeah. Well, that's kind of where Sue and I was. So we had visited different churches around town, and there's a lot of good churches in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's, it's a good city, a lot, of, a lot of good churches here. But none of them really felt like home. We just, we'd visit, it was okay. But... So I remember it was a Saturday night, and Sue and I were at home, and, and uh, we, were, we were talking about, we just can't keep living like this. We have got to somehow get plugged in somewhere. Uh, we just felt like we were just kind of aimlessly now going through life. And uh, we kept saying, things have got to change. And that was the big word, you know, things have got to change. We can't just keep living like this. And so she said, you know, uh, I saw the other day that Pastor Dave Roberson has got a, he's got a church now just a couple of miles down the road from us. So said, you remember us seeing him in the early 80s and we had seen him once. Uh, at Grace Fellowship Church. I think Bobby Andian was the pastor at the time. And I vaguely remembered him. He had a mustache in those days, uh, Pastor Dave did. And we remembered he was funny. <laughs> said, oh, he's got a church? All right, we'll go down there and we'll, we'll, we'll go there in the morning and see what it's like. Now, to be honest with you, at that point we had been uh, somewhat disillusioned again by church to a certain degree. And so I had gotten this little bit of a distrust. Can I say it that way? <laughs> a little bit, little bit of a distrust for pastors. Uh, I wasn't sure that I could trust them anymore. And so we came into the church, and I remember we sat over on that side of the, of the auditorium, and really we were trying to kind of hide. <laughs> we were just, we were going to test the waters, you know. So we purposely sat down in the middle. Uh, there was a lot of group in that area, you know, a lot of people right there. So we thought we'd just kind of hide there in that group. And uh, Pastor Dave comes out, begins the service. And, all right, things are going okay. He wasn't five minutes, I don't think, into that service. And suddenly he just kind of stops. And he walks right down, right down towards where we're sitting over there. And I see him walking in our direction. I start scooching down in the chair. And he walks right over and he's looking right at Sue and I. And he goes, you two right there, you two. And I, we're both like this. And he's going, no, no, you two right there. And I'm going, he says, yes, you. He said, I saw the hand of God come down on you two. Would you two mind stepping out in the aisle and let me pray for you? Well, what are you going to do? Say no. <laughs> so, so we, oh, you know, I said, I felt like going, we're new, we just came to hide, we, we just wanted to test the waters, you know. But you, you don't do any of that, so we stepped out in the aisle over there, and now here he comes. Now remember our discussion the night before. Things have got to change. He walks up to us, and those of you that are familiar with Dave, he just kind of does this, and, and he was listening. And he says, I see a banner over your heads with the word change written on it. Of all the things he could have said, I see the word change on that banner. And the two of you really need change, don't you? And the blessings of God. And I remember going, yeah, <laughs> we do. I knew right then that the Holy Ghost had my number somehow. Somehow God, I knew God had been in our living room the night before. And somehow God was speaking through this man, making the connection with the one word that God knew would, would get me. He says, well, I pray those blessings upon you. And I remember he just barely, Dave just barely touched me on the cheek. But to me, I, I heard like a crackle, like you take two electric wires and spark them together. I heard a spark like that. 
And I didn't even know there was any catchers behind me, but it's a good thing there was because I went sliding back. I don't even really know exactly what he prayed for Sue, but she didn't go sliding back like I did. Well, we were hooked. I, uh, the Holy Ghost used the one word that he knew that we had talked about the night before, and I knew there was a connection here. God somehow was drawing us through this man, Pastor Dave. Well, at the time, I was, uh, I w I was uh, a long-haul truck driver. Now, I really have an engineering degree, and we'll get into that another time, how I wound up uh, driving trucks. We went through a terrible recession in the 80s, and, and I, you know, you got a uh, man's got to keep food on the table. By the way, I love that trucking job, but that's another, that's another story. <laughs> but anyway, I was gone most of the time. I, I, was, I, I delivered all over the United States and Canada, so I'm gone most of the time. Uh, I can't come to the church services, but Sue would come. And they, they, they gave their tapes away free here. And we didn't have much money, but Sue would get those free tapes every service. And boy, when I'd come in off the road, I was usually only home for a day or day and a half, and then I was gone again. Man, I'd take most handful of tapes with me, whatever she'd gotten, and I'd, I'd take them in the trucks and I'd listen. And I had never heard teaching like what Pastor Dave was teaching on these tapes. He, was, uh, uh, he wasn't doing away with any of the faith teaching that we had heard over the, over the previous 12 years. In fact, he would make statements like, I am a, I am a faith man. My, my underwear is made out of a Tulsa faith flag. <laughs> and I needed to hear that because I knew that faith in God's Word had saved me. Faith in God's Word had delivered me from cancer. And maybe at other times, I'll tell you about some other miracles. I knew faith works. But Dave would say this. He said, look, it's good to be a man of faith, a man or woman of faith. It's good to believe God's Word and not be moved by the circumstances. But he says, what you really need is to couple up that faith with the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He said, there is a way where you don't have to go through life trying to figure out what it is God wants you to do. He said, Jesus said, I have, I've sent the Holy Spirit. He's going to guide you into all truth. He said, He shall take of mine and show it unto you. And there's a, there's a way, if you want to know, where you can start hearing God's voice for yourself. And you can begin, he said, you know, Jesus is alive. He has a plan, a, a right now plan for your life. And how he delivers that is by the, by the agency of the Holy Spirit. But he says you have to learn how to train yourself, train that part of you that listens, how to hear the voice of the Holy Ghost. So he started, and I don't want to teach all of those things necessarily on, on this message, but I want to tell you mostly what the end result of it was. Well, Dave began teaching us, and it, it does involve praying a lot in other tongues. Uh, let, me, let me read a verse for you out of 1 Corinthians 14. Let me find it here. I think I can find it pretty quick. 1 Corinthians 14. I'll just summarize this part. It says, verse 2, it says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, how be it in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. Now, I remember Dave saying it like this. This is like in the early, early days, fundamentals. He says, so when you're speaking in an unknown tongue, without a doubt, you are communicating mysteries. He says, now what do you think? While that communication is going on, do you think you are explaining mysteries to God that he didn't know about two millennia before you were born? No. He says, no. While that communication is going on, God is explaining mysteries to you that you've wanted to know your whole life. What kind of mysteries? What's my calling? Do you have a plan for my life? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to be? I started remembering Acts 16, Paul and Silas and the leadership that they would get by the Holy Spirit. And see, Jesus says, he says, uh, when, the, when, the, uh, when the, the Holy Spirit, he's not going to speak of himself. What he hears, that's what he speaks. For years, I didn't really understand that too well, but I do understand it now. See, the Holy Spirit has not come really to be our Lord. He has come to bring us the Lordship 
of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is alive and well. Just like he had assignments for Peter and James and John when he was in, uh, in the flesh, the one we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just like he had assignments for them at then, he has assignments for his body now. But how he delivers that, I, I, I can't with my physical ear go up to Jesus and hear his physical voice speaking in my physical ear. So what he's done by the Holy Spirit who is omnipresent, he's God also, he's everywhere all at once, he's with Jesus at this very moment, he's with me at this very moment, he's with all of you at this very moment. He has taken the role of the great communicator. He knows the, the mind of Christ for every individual believer. And if we learn how to communicate these mysteries, they're not really mysteries to him. They're mysteries to us. So one of the foundational things that we learn from Pastor Dave is, you know, you can come in, in that same chapter, Paul says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. He that's, I think the very next verse says, uh, he, that, uh, he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and to exhortation and comfort. He that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, but he that prophesies edifies the church. Now, what's he talking about there? Well, Paul, look at the revelation knowledge that we have from Paul. Paul would come into a church and he would teach. We have record of many of his revelations right here. Where did he get that revelation knowledge? He says, I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. He that speaks in an unknown tongue, he's communicating mysteries with the Holy Spirit. So not only does the Holy Spirit bring you the plan of God, but he also, he is the great teacher of the body of Christ. He can take the word of God and he can tailor individual messages just for you. See, the Holy Spirit knows everything about Gary Carpenter. He knows the, can I say the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows, he knows my education. He knows he knows every experience I've ever had. He, he has used everything in my life. He's used everything from a, an elm tree to, to experiences I've had. He'll, he'll use that and then combine it with the truth of God's Word to teach me faith and teach me how to walk in ways that if he used those same lessons for somebody else, it might not mean anything to him. He tailors his instructions like a tutor, like one-on-one. -on -one. See, he is infinite. From his point of view, he has all of eternity just for you. He, he has nothing else to do as far as he's concerned except just for you. But he feels that same way about me and the same way about every individual believer because he's an infinite God. So he has eternity just for you. Well, what determines how much time that, I mean, how much of those mysteries we under, we, that we comprehend? He's always ready to pray. He's always there willing to teach. The question is, how much time are we willing to give him to pray these mysteries? Uh, Pastor Dave has tape series after tape series. Well, I keep saying tape. I guess I'm dating myself. Nowadays, they have MP3 series. We have DVDs and CDs. All of those foundational lessons, what we around here, we call the message. Uh, what all praying in other tongues does for you. Well, long story short, let me, let me start giving you personal testimony here. Remember I told you I was, I was uh, long haul trucking at the time. I'm gone for hours, weeks, days at a time. Uh, I would average anywhere from 60 to 70 hours in those trucks. Well, for the first six months of, of listening to those cassette tapes, I didn't do much praying because I was not yet convinced that what Pastor Dave was teaching was true. I didn't know. So for the first six months, I would, I would listen to the tapes and I'd write down the scripture references. And then when I had some time, then I would get my Bible out and I would go through those scripture references because one thing I'd already learned, you can lift verses out of their setting and make the Bible say anything. I mean, years before, I'd, I'd, you know, you can take two verses. Jesus, uh, Judas went out and hung himself. Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you can lift verses out of their setting and make them say anything. So I would study those verses that Pastor Dave would use. But I, I noticed that he didn't just lift little verses. He would teach in whole chapters. He would teach out of, he'd teach the whole chapter of Romans chapter 8. He would, all of the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 14, Luke 6, on and on and on. 
And, and so I studied for six months his messages, looking at the scriptures and also trying to see them in the context. I wanted to make sure he wasn't just uh, stringing together verses to prove some, something he made up in his own mind. Well, after about six months, I told my wife, I said, I come in off the trip and I said, I've been studying this for six months. I have, I have searched and searched. I can't find anything wrong with what he's teaching. So I'm going to start doing this. And so I made a commitment to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm stuck in the cab of this truck about 60 or 70 hours a week anyway. I'm going to turn off the CB radio. I'm going to turn off the regular radio. And Lord, I'm just going to make the cab of these trucks my prayer closet. And what, what I'm going to do, Lord, if I'm, if I'm driving, if I'm in the cab of this truck, I'm going to be praying in other tongues. Doesn't that sound real easy to make a commitment like that? <laughs> well, I started trying to do it. And I still remember the first day uh, I would start praying, you know, and, and of course I'm excited. I'm going to, I'm praying these mysteries of God. God's going to come. He's going to explain things to me. This is going to be wonderful. So I start praying and uh, I probably sounded something like this, you know, I'm driving the truck. After about an hour of that, your throat starts getting scratchy. <laughs> I remember, oh yeah, Dave says, uh, God's not hard of hearing. It's not the volume of speaking. It's the words that you're speaking. I said, okay. So I learned to start praying a lot softer in other tongues. Now what'll happen if you're not used to it? You'll be, I'm driving the trucks. I mean, I have to keep my, the wonderful thing about praying in other tongues, it is your spirit that's doing the praying. That's there in 1 Corinthians 14 also. When I speak in an unknown tongue, it is my spirit. It's the spirit man doing the, the praying. At that moment, the understanding is unfruitful. So my mind, thank God, if you're driving a big rig down the road, was able to concentrate on my driving, drive safely. But I'm learning to pray, pray the mysteries, just pray in other tongues. Well, one hour goes by, nothing. I don't, I don't hear anything, I don't see anything. Two hours go by. My mind would drift. I, uh, I would catch myself not praying. I'd thinking about something. I don't know how long I'd been not praying. Well, the only thing you can do in a case like that is repent. So I'd, I'd, I'd say, whoops, Lord, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to start again. But after you, you just keep after it. I don't know how many times I had to just start again, start again, praying in tongues. Now, I want to do this part on purpose because the, the way uh, truck drivers drive, it's 10 hours on, 10 hours driving, and eight hours off. So I had a 10 hour shift. One hour, I didn't hear a thing from the Lord. Two hours, nothing. Three hours, nothing. Four hours, again, I wish, I was hoping for a beam of light from heaven. I was hoping for a brush of an angel's wing. There was nothing. I started to hear thoughts like this. This is stupid. This is not accomplishing anything. You'd be, why don't you just put on some Christian music and listen to that or be listening to the tapes or anything other than just sitting here praying. Look, nothing's happening. You're not hearing anything from heaven. Nothing's happening. Just quit. Those thoughts kept coming and coming. Now, fortunately, Dave's a real good teacher and he had warned us he, on those tapes I'd listened to. He said, look, the enemy's going to come. He's going to try and talk you out of doing, uh, doing this praying in other tongues because he wants you to stay ignorant. He wants you to stay where you are. So I'm just a, one thing that I did get from my daddy is I am a persistent cuss. I mean, I like to say it this way. I just don't have any quitting sense. So I decided I'm going to at least make it through that first, first 10 hours. I'm going to, I said I was going to pray and I'm going to pray. But now can you, you know, get this. Now five hours go by, six hours go by, seven hours go by. I'm still praying. Eight hours go by. I mean, it is getting more discouraging by the minute. Nothing has happened, no revelation, no vision, no communication. It's been dry as it can possibly be. Uh, I've been continuously, I'm, the, are, you, are you hearing anything, Gary? Oh yeah, I'm hearing this is not working. This is not accomplishing anything. You should stop this. You're over into foolishness now. Those kind of thoughts, that's all I was hearing. I thank God I did not quit after the ninth hour because during that 10th hour of prayer, that last hour of praying that day, I'm just driving along and I didn't know really what to expect. 
I'm just driving, and suddenly I have my first what I call teaching vision. Now, these are not the kind like, uh, like Peter on the rooftop and fell over in a trance. Thank God, because I'm driving a, <laughs> a big rig down the highway, you know. What it is, it's more like a little movie, and it's like a flash almost, and it, but it, you can see it in your mind. I, I, I try and remind uh, most people in my generation, my age, have seen uh, Gone with the Wind. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you're too young for that. But there's a scene in there that most people that saw the movie never forget, and it's where Rhett Butler, and I'm going to clean it up a little for church, but Rhett Butler, he says, frankly, Scarlett, I don't care anymore, <laughs> and he leaves. Now, most people, even though they saw that movie 30 years ago, in their mind, they can replay that. They can see it. That's the way these teaching visions are. It's like a little scene in my mind. I had been studying faith for years, and, and I had had some good success with the principles of faith. I had been healed. I've told you before about the cancer. I could tell you other things that had happened where I was able to operate in faith to some degree. But then I could tell you other stories where I had tried to launch out in faith, mainly by seeing what other people had done. I would try and go do that, and I would fall flat on my face. Well, this little vision comes, and he taught me faith. He personalized it in a way for Gary that I've, it's changed my life forever. Now, I'm going to go ahead and share this one with you just to give you a taste. How he, how he teaches you may be completely different. But now I saw this quickly. I saw it like a little movie in my mind. It, was, it didn't interfere with my driving. But here's what I saw. I saw a man standing on a totally flat plane, like it'd be if you're familiar with the Bonneville Salt Flats. It just went on flat forever to the horizon. And here's a man standing out there. He's looking up into the sky. And up in the sky, like where clouds would normally be, there were these like ellipses drawn up in the sky, like kind of like clouds, but they weren't clouds. They were these circles or more like ellipses. Written on each one of those were wonderful things. Like I remember one of them said salvation. One of them said health. One of them said prosperity. One of them said joy. One of them said anointing. On and on and on. All of these wonderful things that everybody wants to have. Well, the man standing on this flat desert He's looking up, and he wants those things. Now, in my vision, eh, he starts gathering up dirt together. He starts trying to build a little mound. He's going to try and get his way to heaven, you know, get up to where he could reach those clouds. And he starts jumping and trying to, to reach and grab a hold of, of those ellipses because he wants those things. But it was, I'm watching in this little mini vision, I'm thinking, that's just as foolish as somebody standing on the earth thinking they can jump up and touch a cloud. And I watched him in his futility for a while going, well, this is impossible. There's no way he can. I mean, those are wonderful things. It's a shame that he can't have any of them. Then in the, in the vision, in the dream, whatever you want to call it, it wasn't a dream because I was awake and driving, but in this vision, all of a sudden, from those ellipses, here's the man, here's the man standing here, and from, from these ellipses, this, these lines came down from each one to the man, like a pencil line drawn almost, from each one of these ellipses coming. And then I could see there was substance flowing down that line from the ellipse to the man. Whatever was in the ellipse was flowing down that line. So out of one was flowing salvation. Out of another one was flowing health. Out of another one was flowing love. Out of another, all these things were flowing down the lines. And I'm going, whatever that line is, Whatever that line is, that's the key. That's the key to receiving what's up there. If I only knew what was that, what, what is that line? What are those lines? And in my vision at that moment when that question had formulated in my mind, it like zoomed in. All of a sudden I'm zoomed in and it turns a little bit because written on each line was one word. And that word was faith. And I got it. There's nothing the man could do to work or earn any of those blessings of God. The blessings of God are by grace and by grace alone. And there is only one way to receive it, and that is by faith. It's an end to our works. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. We receive freely of His grace by faith. Now, for me personally, that changed my life forever. 
I understood in a way that I'd never understood before. It's not based on my giving, my striving, my church attendance, my nothing. It's not based on my works at all. You receive from God one way and one way only, and you receive from Him by faith. Does that remind you of a verse? The just shall live by faith. Well, hallelujah. Man, I was excited. I remember pulling off at the very next opportunity there. Uh, in those days, we didn't have cell phones. I'm dating myself a little bit now, aren't I? We didn't have cell phones. So in order for me to call my wife, I had to find a pay phone. So the next little truck stop, I'd pull off. I'm excited. And I call Sue up, and I'm, I'm all excited, and I'm trying to explain this vision to her. But it was so new to my mind. My spirit man had it, but my mind had trouble. So I'm trying to explain it, and I'm going, lines, man, desert, blessings, faith. And she's going, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> And I'm going, oh, wait a minute. My spirit's got it. My mind doesn't. I'll call you later. Click. <laughs> so, anyway, later on, I was able to communicate it to her like I was able to communicate it to you all ago. Well, man, I'm excited now. This, is, this deal is on. Now, in those days, I didn't have a, a tape recorder. I didn't have uh, any uh, a way of recording anything. So what I did, I bought a spiral notebook that you can buy for like, a, in those days, a, less than a quarter. And what I did, every time I would have a vision or a dream or a revelation or anything, then I would write it down in there. Because I always figured, well, if God is going to be good enough to come and, if God the Holy Ghost, He's God, if He's going to be good enough to come and teach me, I would at least show enough respect to make record of it somehow. So I would write, you know, and I can't draw at all, so I would draw my little stick man figure there in the desert and the ellipses, and I did my best to, to draw that one up. I'm excited for the next one. Boy, I'm, I, I take my eight hours off, and I can't hardly even sleep because I'm excited about the next shift. Hallelujah. I'm going to pray these mysteries of God. God's going to communicate to me. This is wonderful. I have found it. I have found it. So I start praying the next shift. I could go slow again, but can you picture how long 10 hours is praying in other tongues, praying in other tongues, praying in other tongues, 10 hours, I didn't hear a thing. I didn't see no vision. I didn't hear God's voice. I didn't have one goosebump. All I heard for the 10 hours was that was a fluke. That was just your own mind. That's not really the Holy Ghost. There's nothing to this. You should stop praying. That's all I heard for 10 hours, praying in other tongues. I was so discouraged. I remember going, to, taking my eight-hour break, starting the next shift again after my eight-hour break. Again, I just don't have much quitting sense at all. Here I start again, hour one, hour two, hour three. Somewhere around the fifth hour, I had my, sec, my second teaching encounter with the Holy Ghost. Now, this time it wasn't a vision. This time it was just words, and I heard it. I'm, I'm sure it probably was not audible, but to me it seemed like it was. And I heard these words. Now, today these words are very simple to me. To me they're very elementary. But at that time, my understanding of Old Testament and New Testament and the difference between the law and grace were very juvenile. Let me say it that way. So I just always equated Moses with the law and Jesus with grace, and that's all there was to that. And I heard, I just heard these words. And it said like this, I think I can still quote them exactly. It says, the, the deliverance of Israel through Moses was certainly not by the law, for the law had not yet been given. And I went, huh, who ever thought of that? And I got to, I couldn't wait till I, I had opportunity to get my Bible out and check it again. Sure enough, the law doesn't come, the Ten Commandments doesn't come till Exodus 20. They're already out of Egypt, crossed over, the Red Sea deal has already happened, Pharaoh's been drowned. They're already been delivered, and the law's not even been given yet. Of course, as time goes on, you know, I could write, the teacher in me right now <laughs> wants to teach, you know. So, well, I didn't know it then. I know it now. Moses was a type and a shadow of Jesus. God did all the work through one man. Did, could the people do anything to get themselves free from Pharaoh? No. So God sends a deliverer. He did all the work through this one man, all these signs and wonders that finally got him free. He did all the work through one man. 
And then finally, that man says, you want to be free? Come and follow me and let him across the Red Sea. It's a perfect type and shadow of Jesus. God did all the work through one man. Mankind couldn't do anything to, uh, to get ourselves free from sin, so God himself has to come. He, comes, he sends one man, his son, Jesus Christ. All the work is done through that one man, and he says, you want to be free? Come and follow me. <laughs> See, that's good stuff. But in those early days, I mean, to hear that, you just don't know how life-changing it was for me at the time. Well, now the deal is really on. I continued to pray. Uh, from that point on, I couldn't be beat out of it at all anymore. And I continued to pray in those trucks for a total of 17 months. And every time, uh, sometimes it would be a vision. Sometimes it would be a, uh, I would hear words. Sometimes it would just be a revelation. Suddenly, something that I always wondered about, something from the Bible, I would understand it. And I didn't know how I understood it, but I understood it. And I could, I could, reference it in the Bible. I could show you chapter and verse from several ways, you know. That process just continued, and I'd write them down in the spiral notebook. Now, later on, and I'm going to say later on, years later, as we got a computer and, and uh, my wife began typing those for me, and, and uh, they became lessons, and much even today, that those were the foundation stones of the ministry even today. Because that process has continued to this very hour, and I still, I pray and understand more. I, I learned to tap in to the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit. But it was through uh, Pastor Dave's teaching. And it fundamentally started with sp starting to spend time praying in other tongues. Well, for me, I wasn't getting a whole lot of direction. Well, now, see, I'm getting a check even on that. I do remember the first direction, because what I'm really after is, remember what I was really after? How do you get the personal leadership of the Holy Spirit? Well, right, the first thing that came was not so much leadership, it was teaching. He was, by vision, by revelation, and by voice, the first thing that began to happen, he began teaching me the understanding of God's Word. But I do remember my first leadership type instruction that came by the Holy Ghost. It's not at all what I expected. Uh, I was still driving the trucks, and just as clear as you're hearing my voice, one day I heard him say, I want you to lose 40 pounds. <laughs> now, I've been driving trucks for over four years. Uh, driving trucks, you don't get much exercise, and there's, it's boring, and so you snack and you eat, and little by little by little, I, I was even bigger than I am now, and I was quite a bit younger. But anyway, he says, I want you to lose 40 pounds. Well, my soul began arguing. My intellect began arguing. said, Lord, I, I, how can I lose 40 pounds? I mean, I'm stuck in the cab of this truck. I can't get any exercise. I, I, I have designated places where I have to stop and get fuel. That's where I have to eat. You know what these truck stops are like. None of, anyone, no one, none of you ever argued with the Lord, did you? <laughs> well, he let me get through with all my arguing. But then I, I said, but Lord, if there's a way, just show me how. Well, as I continued to pray, I remember this, this understanding began coming to me that even in the truck stops, there were simple principles, simple things, like first off, stop eating so many hamburgers, so hot dogs and that type of thing. Start eating more uh, salads and thing, you know, things that are better for you. But it was other things, like eat smaller amounts more often. Huh, I didn't know that that had a lot to do with your metabolism. He began teaching me, long story short, by obeying the instructions that I received from praying in other tongues, I got his personal, hand-tailored diet plan for Gary Carpenter, and I lost 40 pounds in seven months. 40 pounds. That's pretty good, for, especially when you can't exercise. I did it anyway. Well, his leadership came. I'm, I'm having to jump over so many things. I, I'm going to go ahead and tell you this part. The, the Lord always has a reason a lot of, for everything that he does. Part of me wants to jump over this, but I'm not going to. I don't think he wants me to. Why was it so mandatory? Why, when I think of my life at the time, I had a lot of flaws. <laughs> not Being 40 pounds heavy was just one of to, In my mind, there were other things that to me, I would have thought more important to deal with 
than my weight. But what he went on first, the first leadership that I really got was lose 40 pounds. Well, here's why. See, the Lord knows the future like we know the past. He knows everything. Shortly after I lost that seven, seven, um, lost that 40 pounds, I, I had a, I had a heart problem that came on me suddenly, unawares, and I nearly died. I came within a few breaths of leaving the planet. Uh, it was the end of my truck driving. They wouldn't let me drive trucks after that. But uh, I come really close. You know, you, you know when you've come within two or three breaths of leaving the planet. Now, thank God I survived. But I've often thought since then, if my heart had been carrying an extra 40 pounds to support, would I have survived that? I doubt it. And I think the Lord, looking at my life, seeing all those other things, well, we can deal with them later. We got to keep him alive first. <laughs> so the first instruction he gives me, lose that 40 pounds. And if I hadn't have done it, I think I'd have been off the planet. When the Lord tells you to do something, he's got a reason. I've learned, uh, I, wish, I wish I could sit here and tell you that Gary's always been perfectly obedient to obey everything the Lord has said. If I've been obedient at all, usually it's haltingly and stumblingly, um, <laughs> you know. But, uh, I, I, I do eventually usually obey, but it's usually not as quick and as orderly as I should have. But I'll tell you this much. I have learned over these years, he has a reason for everything he does. Whatever the Lord says to you, you need to do that. Well, I want to fast forward a little more. After, uh, after I left the trucks, he put us into full-time ministry. That 17 months of praying, see, did you know the Bible says God is, a, he, he answers before we call? As I look back on my life now, a lot of times you can't see his leadership nearly as well as you can in hindsight. See, he knew before the foundations of the world that one day Sue and I would be coming to this church. Did you know he already had us in a house about two miles from the church? He had me in a job. I mean, I can't think of a more perfect job to be in if a guy wants to pray a lot, 60 or 70 hours a week. He had me in a job where basically I could be paid to pray. Just up to me. Do I want to pray or not? I'm going to get paid anyway. I know that he had me in the perfect house and the perfect job for, to get us a, a jump start, if you will, because I was already in my 40s. I'm not a, I'm not a teenager. I'm not in my 20s anymore. I got, a, I got a lot of catching up to do. So he had me in that job where I could just really pray a lot. Not only these mysteries, not only the understanding of God's Word and revelation knowledge, but he needs to catch me up on his plan. Well, uh, he called us into full-time ministry. I'm going to jump over a lot of things. What we started doing was traveling and start ministering at different churches around. Uh, as we continued to do that, he always told us to make all of our teachings available free. We always recorded them. And we always made the cassettes available for free to anyone who wanted them around the world. That developed into quite a ministry even on its own. There was one point in time. Now, that's very expensive to do it that way. And we had virtually no income at all. Uh, there was a period there where just the postage to send those tapes around the world would be $4,500 a month, not to count uh, the cost of the tapes and the, the machines and the and uh, paying payroll and trying to eat any yourself. And, uh, it was very expensive to do, but he, that's what he said to do. And so we did it for years. And, and uh, we developed a, a relationship with people in many countries. They would receive the tapes, and some of them, he always told me, now he said, here we go again. Now here's the instruction he gave me. He says, if you will obey me and send everything for free, I will speak to the hearts of the people I choose to support you and the needs of the ministry. Well, uh, that's what he said. 
Remember what faith is? <laughs> Remember what faith is? Faith believes what God says no matter what it looks like. Well, I got to tell you, a lot of times it looked like he didn't say that. <laughs> I mean, we'd be right down to the wire in those early days. I mean, Sue and I were believing God for the next meal that come on the table. I remember one time we had done everything we knew to do, and we didn't even have enough money to put a dollar's worth of gas in the gas tank. So what I, I couldn't leave the house. We, I knew if I left in either, in either vehicle, we'd just get a block or two away, and we'd be out of gas. So, so what I did for two days, I just walked around the backyard and prayed in other tongues and worshiped God. I didn't know what else to do. I said, look, my attitude was like, I've done all I know to do. The ball's in your court. I'm not going to beg. I'm not going to. I'm not going to start charging money for what you've given. You know, you told me to give it away free. That's what we're going to do. And if I can't do anything else, I'm just going to walk around this yard and praise you and pray in tongues. I did that for two days. And then on the third day, somebody just, who doesn't know the situation, they don't, you know, they're just friends, just people. They don't know what our situation is. They come over to visit. We're visiting for a little while. And they're kind of embarrassed to even say it, but they go, uh, we, we hope this doesn't offend you, but we feel like God is, is telling us to, we, we want to give you this gasoline credit card. <laughs> we, we, we don't know why, but we, we think God wants you to use this credit card to put gas in your vehicles. We're going to leave it with you. Now, don't, don't be using it for other things. Don't be out going to Walmart. <laughs> you know? But we think you're, you're supposed to use it for your gasoline. So I, I take it and I go, how long am I supposed to use it? And they look at each other and they go, he didn't say about that. And they're, they're going, well, until he tells us to come get it, I guess. Well, now we were real careful. We didn't use that card for anything but necessary gas. And we didn't go off on no trips either. We used it to go to church and go to you know, work and do those kind of things. It was, a, I think, if I remember correctly, it was almost a year before God sent them back to get that card. He provided gas for us through that card for almost a year. He amazes me. Now, those, those are the early days. Uh, see, I had no idea when I was praying those mysteries in the cab of that truck, part of the plan, His calling for our life, that not only would He call us to travel all over the United States and preach His Word. Do you know we saw cancer healed to Sue and I do our hands it's all him well, we saw him heal cancer through these hands it's a <laughs> I lose words because Sue and I we, one thing you'll if you spend, ever spend any time with us you're going to find out we're as plain as they come we're just people from Oklahoma there's nothing special about us we're just as plain as dirt but we found a way to fellowship with God through the teachings of Pastor Dave Roberson. We found a way where we can communicate with him and he could begin using us in ways that he never was able to use us before. We began to find his leadership and he began taking us on these teaching trips around the country and then he started taking us around the world. In 2003, we got to minister in Poland never been to Europe before, never been out of the country before. That same year, I spent a month in South Africa teaching all over around Johannesburg and Pretoria and all these little towns. Got to teach uh, in the Zulu camp where it, through an interpreter uh, in, in the Zulu language teaching God's Word. For 30 days I was there. Then we had our first trip to Asia, South Korea. I've been there six times now, six different years preaching the Word of God, teaching. God, we've seen God do miracles. Who knew all of that was in those mysteries that I kept praying? And it wasn't just me. I'm just telling you my side of the story. If Sue was sitting here, she'd tell you about all the times her, her praying, how God began teaching her. He, I wish she was here to teach you about the, uh, uh, how one of the first revelations he got across to her was the words of her mouth and how important that they were. She would get together with other women, and trust me, Gary's got flaws. I'm just, I, I've got, my wife can sit and talk with other wives, and, and uh, if she wanted to, she could, you know, as they start talking about their husband, oh, my husband does this, and my husband does that. She could have joined in, trust me, and probably had more to say than them. 
But God, right from the beginning, began teaching her, especially out of Proverbs, about the words of her mouth. So she would, you know, just kind of wait. And here's these women, they're talking and kind of complaining and talking about their husbands. Finally, you know, eventually it's your turn to say something. She'll say, well, now this is by faith, she was saying. She said, I don't know what to tell you. He said, my, my husband never, nothing perverse or crooked ever comes out of his mouth. All of his words are princely. He only speaks in line with God's word all the time. My husband is an excellent provider. He loves me like Christ loves the church. She would just go on and on and on. What she was doing was saying what the Bible says, not saying how I really was at the time. Now, Gary, have you improved? I hope to God I have. I, she, you'd have to talk to her. I think I have, okay? But trust me, even today, there's things, you know? But he was, don't think it was just me. He was teaching her uh, uh, the importance of her word. She would declare God's word over our children, declare God's word over me, declare God's word over our house. Uh, I'll tell you this one little story here. Just... In the early days, he's teaching us about the power of his, uh, the spoken word. Sue had this plant that she just loved. It was a, what about, it was a, I don't know if you can see that plant. It's a plant about as tall as a man. And uh, we had it on a, uh, it was in a bucket thing. Uh, maybe the bucket was this big around and that plant coming out. And all of a sudden it just started getting real sickly. And she didn't know why she'd had this plant for years. It had always done well, it looked fine. Uh, she inspected it for bugs or anything, couldn't find anything like that, but it was, start, it was dying, there's no doubt about it. It was just getting real sickly and kind of brown looking. So she walks up, now God's been teaching her, right? So she walks up to it one day. She says, I curse whatever is killing my plant. Die in Jesus' name. We didn't do that in the churches I grew up in. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is not the way that we did it in the churches I grew up in, but that's what she did. The very next morning when we got up, she looked at that plant. The entire surface of, that, of, the, of the dirt, on the entire surface of that bucket was covered with little white worms that were dead. Something in the soil, these, some kind of little wormy things, was eating that plant from underground. She cursed it in Jesus' name. They all died, just came to the surface, and that thing was covered just completely covered with those little worms. She scooped them out of there and threw them away, and that, tr that plant just thrived. It did fine. I could go on and on and on. Now, let me tell you this. The leadership that comes by the Holy Spirit. Not only did He start leading us, and I told you how on my own, I probably would have wound up pastoring a church uh, because that's all I ever really knew. Uh, my temperament seemed to kind of be in line with that. Uh, that's all I ever really saw growing up. But see, he knows who you are. See, Jesus really assigns every part of his body. You don't really get to choose if you're going to be an apostle or a prophet or a pastor or a teacher or an evangelist. He chooses. He makes you what you are. He places you in the body where you belong. I had heard that kind of thing, but how do you find out? Well, one day while I'm in prayer, I'm just praying, praying those mysteries. I wasn't really seeking him, although I had asked him many times now, what do you, you know, what, what am I in your body? What am I? Am I this or that? I, I just assumed I was probably going to be a pastor one day. And then one day, just in prayer, I think I can quote this again, word for word. I heard just as clear as a bell. This, the Holy Spirit said it this way. It said, he, I'm sure he means Jesus, he has not called you to pastor, and he never will. I thought, huh. Well, what's the next question after that? What has he called me to be? And I heard just clear as a bell again. He says, you are a teacher in the body of Christ. That's your calling. That's where your anointing is. And that is where your provision is. And don't ever forget it. Well, I haven't. Now, people call me Pastor Gary all the time, and that's okay with me. I'm not legalistic about this. But see, right on the other hand, I know I'm not one. I'm a teacher in the body. Uh, I, it won't do for me to try and be something else. Now, 
God might have me fill in for somebody at times. He's had me do that for Pastor Dave when he's in Brazil. That's fine. People can call me pastor. But see, I know I'm never going to have my own little church. I'm never going to be pastoring. I might run a, a Bible school someday or, or something in a teaching fashion, but it's not going to be a church. Now, see, what happens, too, is you get set free. When, when you start hearing from the Holy Ghost like that, you start hearing His voice for yourself. It sets you free from well-intended people and prophecies that are not really from the Lord. Since that date, I can't tell you the number of prophecies I've had from people that don't know me very well. And they'll say, oh, yeah. You know, it usually starts with yeah. <laughs> yeah, Brother Gary, I, the Lord is showing me that you're going to pastor this big church, and I see the steeple and all of the people. And, you know, I don't ever embarrass them or anything. I let them go ahead because usually it's in public, not always. And I don't ever embarrass them. You know, I said, well, thank you very much. I know they mean well. But see, once you've learned to hear the Holy Ghost for yourself, you just can't be moved by that kind of thing anymore. So I'll say, well, thank you, thank you. Keep praying. <laughs> Keep praying, thank you. And just let them go on. But I know that I'm not called to that. Well, I'm telling you, it's a great day when you find out your calling in the body of Christ. It's a great day when you learn that place on the inside of you where the Holy Spirit communicates. It's a great day when you start getting in on the... the Yanji Cho used to say it this way, and I like it. The language of the Holy Spirit is dreams and visions. I found that to be very much the case. And when you start getting in on his visions and his dreams, you are on your way. Well, I hope this short testimony blessed you. I'm looking forward to the next time that we're together.